Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Get Ready to Weather the Storm. We are so excited to share best practices, strategies for pre-loss planning, communication tools, and the do's and don'ts before and after the storm. My name is Millie Ventura, and I'm the Business Development Manager for the Palm Beach region here at Castle Group. Eileen Zarella joins me, and she is the Business Development Manager for the Broward region. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Brian? We've muted all participant devices to eliminate the background noise so every, everyone can hear clearly. Feel free to submit your questions at any time by navigating to the Q&A option on the toolbar. Instructions on how to submit the questions are being displayed on your screen. Aileen and I will be monitoring the chat and we will leave the room at the end, at the end for question. Brian will be our moderator for the webinar. Great. All right, next slide, please. Yep. Thank you. So let's meet our panel of experts. Brian, do you want to start? Absolutely. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And I see some more people joining as we go. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it is uh, we're getting ready for hurricane season in 2024, which is uh, kind of scary how fast this uh, this year has gone. Uh, so I'm Brian Street. I'm your executive uh, vice president over operations uh, for the state of Florida and Texas. I've uh, been with Castle for about 12 years now, and uh, the hurricane preparation falls under my my watch. And so some of the slides and everything you'll see is uh, what we do with our managers uh, on a yearly basis as we prepare for the storm. And uh, next up, I'll go over to uh, Brent. Good afternoon, everybody. Brent Dixon. I'm with uh, Unlimited Restoration Incorporated, or URI, as we affectionately call ourselves. Uh, many of you know Erin Nickerson. She's our Director of Sales, and uh, she has asked me to take the responsibility of sharing some information with you guys today. But I've uh, been in restoration for 22 years. I've pretty much seen it all, done it all, been there to help people, and we're uh, happy to share some tips and information to answer your questions today. So thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you, Brent. And uh, Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Swanson. I'm with Insurance Office of America. I am a claims advocate. I've been in the claims industry of insurance since 2000. Um, I am the person I hope you don't have to talk to after a hurricane because that means you have a claim. Um, but in case of a claim, in case of that, you know, hurricane damage, that's I'm here to advocate and look out for you guys to make sure that you get back on your feet um, and back, you know, to, to business as quickly as possible. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. And David. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the family at Strategic Claims, we would like to express our gratitude towards Millie and the rest of the Castle Group for allowing us to be a part of today's discussion. Strategic Claim Consultants is a public adjusting firm headquartered out of Atlanta, Georgia, with our national disaster response team in Tampa, Florida. And for those of you on the call who are unfamiliar with a public adjuster in our services, simply put, we do property damage insurance claim work and are licensed by the state to only represent you all, the homeowner, the association, the policy holder, and the event you occur a loss to ensure that you are paid every penny that you are owed by the insurance company. You know, something that makes us different than other PAs is, well, I challenge anyone on today's call to find another PA firm in the country that has settled north of a billion dollars in claims within the last year. And what this large number represents is there's not a scenario, hurricane, fire, flood, hail, et cetera, that our firm hasn't encountered and can't execute on. Being that hurricane season is just a little over a month away, we offer individual associations, continuing education courses, and our pre-loss planning program to assure they receive all the education they need before a storm to make the most informed decisions following. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to be involved on today's call and look forward to a very productive conversation. Great, thank you, David. And uh, last but not least, Michael. Michael Quinn managing partner of Advanced Roofing. Um, we have offices throughout the state, uh, seven locations, brick and mortar that we own. I'm happy to be on the call today to give you guys, I've seen it all in the last 25 years of what fails um, after a storm, during a storm, and what measures you can take before and after. And even if you have the best roof, sometimes they do fail because of ancillary stuff. So I'm sure we'll talk a little bit further about that um, in the discussion today. Happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much. Uh, so during uh, the, the course of today's agenda, we're going to kind of look at what 23 presented to us. How does 2024 look? 
Uh, and then what you as either a, a manager or a board resident should be doing uh, to prepare for the storm and then how we do things, uh, you know, after a storm is activated and then even post storm as, uh, you know, uh, everybody went in. Oh, and I missed uh, uh, Jerry. Sorry, I apologize, Jerry. Uh, kind of jumped ahead there. No worries, Brian. I feel like you might be hazing me since I'm a former Castle employee. I was with Castle for nine years till till recently. In fact, Brian hired me uh, up at Castle, so I, I feel like he was just, just tricking me a little bit there. But uh, but seriously, um, my name is Jerry Esposito. I'm director of business development with Extreme Landscaping. Um, I was with Castle for nine years. Uh, loved it there. People are wonderful. So if you definitely need some management, that's the place to go. Uh, as far as extreme, um, we are a full service landscaping operation. So obviously we do your monthly maintenance. We have an Arbor division, IPM fertilization, design, irrigation. Um, we have uh, some hurricane prep um, ideas, which we'll dive into a little bit earlier. And we're focused on the South Florida area. Uh, I do have a little bit of company breaking news. Um, and that is for those of you that are not in the South Florida area, we just recently, a, a handful of days ago, merged with Down to Earth Landscaping uh, based out of Maitland, uh, Florida, and the, the Orlando area there in Jacksonville, Tampa, Fort Myers. Um, so now we have uh, the ability to help you statewide. Um, so you can certainly reach out to me and I can uh, you know, put you in touch with my, my new colleagues over there as well, if that's what, you, if that's what you're looking for. Great. And yes, Jerry, just a little bit of hazing. You know, it's uh, it's it's different it's to okay. see the logo on your shirt. So, but great, thank you all very much. Uh, so, as we get started, um, basically, as as Millie mentioned, uh, submit some questions uh, through the Q and A. We're definitely monitoring those as we go along. So, quickly, I just wanted to kind of go. You know, what does uh, you know, twenty twenty four look like? Uh, and as you can see from uh, our our numbers here we're forecasting 20 to 25 name storms this coming year highly active uh, eight to 12 of those uh, will be hurricanes four to seven major hurricanes so definitely a, a above average uh, season is what they are anticipating um last year uh it was 19 uh, seven were actually hurricanes with three major hurricanes um, and I know we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what to do when those major hurricanes hit and, and how to handle. Um, but then our, which was kind of in our average of our 30 year run. So they're anticipating a little bit stronger um, season this year with uh, four to six direct impacts. So again, this is the time to start preparing. And what we need to do is a key component of, of what your management company should do and the partners that your manager and the, and the association should have so that this time of year, you should be sitting around a table and discussing what is your plan moving forward. So again, we're predicting 20 to 25 name storms. Here's our, our list. And you know, there's always that first one. So Alberto, there's always one that happens right before a season officially starts. Uh, so hopefully, uh, we don't get uh, we don't have an early season, but, uh, you know, as people can tell, we had a kind of mild uh, winter, which could lead into a little bit more active uh, season this year. So and just to make sure I, I know we've also had a number of and since this is uh, statewide Florida, we've had a number of people move into the state uh, these last several months. And so just uh, which, you know, they're coming from states that, you know, hurricanes aren't uh, really an issue. So just making sure that we're we're all speaking the same language, you know, hurricane watch is that hurricane conditions, uh, you know, extreme winds and rains and floods are possible within uh, the next 48 hours. A warning is that hurricane conditions are expected in the next 36 hours. And then extreme wind is, you know, anything that's over 115 miles an hour within the, the, the next hour. So, you know, a lot of this is, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of people in Florida that, you know, have lived through, you know, a, a cat one storm and things like that. But, you know, these are definitely big uh, forces of nature that we need to take seriously. And Brian, can I add to this real quick? To that slide? Yeah, I think, you know, as you mentioned, some of the new folks that have moved to Florida in the recent few years for many reasons, you know, this is important to know. Also, that cone of what we call cone of uncertainty, right? And I want to give a direct lesson why you need to pay attention to that. If you're in the cone, obviously be prepared. 
And if you're just north or south, follow those rules as well. You know, we can speak of a couple of years ago from Hurricane Ian and the track that it was on was directly similar to the track that Hurricane Charlie was on in 2004, where it rounded out into the Gulf and everyone thought it was going to Tampa, Florida, which is my home where my family is. And within a couple of days before landfall, it ticked to the right. And the folks in the Fort Myers, Naples area weren't as prepared as they could have been because they were under the assumption because they were on the south end of the cone that they'd be okay. So also adhere to those type of warnings as well, I would say. David, that's a, that's a great point. You know, when when we start communicating early about, you know, and that, that cone of uncertainty is is always, it's that's why it's called the un, uh, cone of uncertainty. It could move left or right and up or down very, very quickly. And, and you're right. Uh, you know, we were anticipating when that storm was coming, it was going to hit in the panhandle. And then every single couple of hours, it just kept inching its way further and further south until it just kind of shot across. So it's it's very important to stay aware. So just quickly, I wanted to kind of go through what, uh, you know, we do at Castle Group from a management standpoint, but, you know, for the board members that are that are on, you know, this is what your manager should be doing, which is developing a hurricane plan with that includes a checklist and, you know, different resident handouts, newsletters, things like that. And what I mentioned by a hurricane plan is, you know, if you have a, uh, if you're, say, a, a horizontal property, an HOA, but you have a big clubhouse, there's pool furniture, there's umbrellas, there's all those different things that are outside that need to be uh, taken inside. So you need to have a plan. How do you get your community ready? And how do we communicate out to the residents? So the residents should be taking things off of their, their patios and, and, out, and out front, you know, flags or, 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 or garden gnomes or whatever it could be outside that could become a projectile. If you're in a, a vertical and in, in a tower, you know what needs to come off of your balcony. How do we move the, the the pool furniture inside? Do we have the space to move the pool furniture? Uh, and then, what are the plans for your major uh, uh, pieces of equipment? Your elevators. Do we need to lower the water on the pool? Uh, you know, all those different things should be part of the plan. And that's why you know you should start this process now. Don't wait until there's already that cone of uncertainty that's out. Uh, forming in the Atlantic or the Gulf, it's it's too late at that point. Um, so, and obviously, you know, you want to really make sure, you know, as, as David and I kind of discussed, there's a lot of new faces, new names, new numbers that are coming in. So making sure that you have your emergency contact numbers, uh, you know, you know who your residents are, you've communicated it out. Um, and then I know we have our, our insurance uh, folks on as well. Let's make sure we have whoever your partner is with, whoever your broker is with, let's make sure that we have the forms necessary um, and then, you know, back to Jerry and the landscaping things, do we have our cleanup agreement? So when those trees fall, branches fall, leaves, do you have something set up prior to that uh, storm uh, in the future? Uh, and then obviously, if you're a tower or you, do you have generators, you know, making sure that that is all part of your plan from, uh, you know, do you have all the fuel? Do you have a contract to have it fuel refilled? You know, most buildings have a generator that can last a couple of days, depending on how much usage is there. Um, and then, you know, obviously you may need to, if there is full power outage, and I know we can all that have been around for a while, remember a couple of the storms where, you know, didn't have power for a few days to up to a week, no, no hot water, you know, things like that. Do you have enough cash on hand to potentially pay for some of the vendors uh, to, to get certain things cleaned up? So this should all be things now that people are working on. And, and Jerry, from a from a landscaping piece, you know, what type of uh, agreements have you put in place? What kind of conversations are you having now that it's we're entering into hurricane season from the landscaping side? No, that's a great question. Obviously, it's the probably the the million dollar question, right? That that boards ask most frequently um, when we're in these presentations and proposals. Um, so first of all, we have over 10 FEMA uh, certified high level personnel uh, within our, our team. Uh, what, what that means is they have the legal ability uh, to be out uh, and about uh, carefully, of course, uh, as the storm is not quite out of here yet, but still still around to uh, start checking out your property. Um, we try to encourage all of our accounts to have a pre-hurricane action plan in, in place. We will be go through all of that so you know exactly what the plan is in an emergency situation. So that way we're authorized ahead of time 
to canvas your property, to assess the damage, to, to quickly dis dispatch uh, team members to your property, uh, even when the weather might not be perfectly safe to come outside yet. So we can start clearing out pathways, uh, assessing emergencies, taking pictures, all that good stuff. And then as time moves on throughout the storm, we're able to, or once the storm is, is maybe out of out of the area, we can start doing more of the, the, the customary standard uh, data and, and uh, capturing. Um, also too, with our new um, partnership with Down to Earth, that's a massive advantage that we have because now if the storm hits Broward County, for example, uh, and our, some of our teams here are, are, are not able to get out, we now have the ability to, 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 to surge resources, chippers, trucks, uh, booms, uh, team members, personnel from all areas of the state to come and uh, prioritize your community. Well, that's great, Jerry. Thank you. And again, I think you're going to hear a lot of uh, you know, preparation, preparation, preparation. Don't wait until there's a name storm. You know, and Michael, from from a roofing side, you know, obviously that's also kind of a cleanup agreement. You know, what if there are projects ongoing now? There's a number of buildings. I'm I'm in Broward County, and you know, there's a lot of uh, projects going on now that uh, you know could be re-roofing uh, or, or working into it. How do you work with the manager on projects that are ongoing and all of a sudden there is a, a named storm that seems to be heading that direction? Yeah, that's a good question. So at the end of the day, we, we if there's a named storm and we're in the cone, we'll, we download the roofs and secure everything that's up there. The good news is that everything that's being installed is installed to the new code. So everybody gets worried that their, their new roof that's going down is going to blow off. Historically speaking, and all, all the jobs that I've had that have been directly hit that were under construction, we fared very well. As long as you get all of the loose equipment material down off the roof and secured um, either in a parking garage or we bring it back to the yard, um, sometimes the issue is space. What we've seen, though, is a lot of times there's ancillary stuff up on the roof that are outside of what the roofing vendor is performing. Um, telecom systems or HVA systems and doors doors on um, HVAC units <clears throat> that will blow off and it will cause more damage than what was going on during the roof. But the message at the end of the day is secure the roof, um, get any loose equipment down on the ground so it can be shrink wrapped, palletized, and, and um, you know, we, we'll put ratchet straps around it and secure it um, on the ground so there's nothing flying around and, and causing uh, any airborne debris damage. Oh, that's excellent. And then as you know, we're still in the pre-storm uh, and we, we do have a couple uh, insurance folks on. So Mary, I just kind of want to start with you and then David from a, a public adjuster side, you know, in the pre-storm, what kind of conversations should should our managers be having now with, you know, either the current broker, um, uh, you know, to, to make sure that we're ready. And then I'll have a follow up for, for David, you know, to make sure that, you know, everything gets kind of addressed prior to a storm even hitting. Sure. Um, I am a huge advocate for an emergency folder, um, and that is printing out your your policy information so you know who to contact as quickly as possible. Uh, time is of the essence, especially in a disaster situation. Um, I'm sure David can, can support that. Um, so insurance claim forms, yes, your broker should have that available to you. If not, we will get you to the right place. We do also have free storm checklists what to go around look for around the property how to secure it how to prepare for the worst case scenario so that is all things that should be coming uh, from your agent from ioa obviously um, and also it should be going to your residents as well assuming they have a different insurance carrier for their internal unit whatever that looks like those should be starting now. Uh, we've been working at IOA on how we do uh, the best possible response and proactively respond to the season of storms that we know Florida to have. And we are seeing the same things you are, Brian. We're seeing those high numbers forecasted for 2024. So really, time is of the essence. A red file folder with contact information for your claims company um, a checklist just showing that, you know, you've gotten everything you can secured and ready. And my last big stress of any preparedness is photographs. What did it look like before and what was the value of the, of the damage? So that's where I would come in as a claims person. It makes the claims adjuster, uh, their job 10 times easier in getting things processed, getting a check to you 
and, and so you can move forward with repairs and getting back to normal. That's great. And then David, from the public adjuster side, you know, anything else that you can add on to what Mary was saying and, and how to how our team and our managers and board and communities uh, can can prepare themselves? Absolutely. It's, it's a great question, Brian and Mary. Great points. I'm going to echo uh, essentially the same points here. There are a handful of things the association can do on their end before the catastrophe to put themselves in the best position in the event they have to file a claim. First and foremost, you, the manager and or the board want to get together with your agent, Mary, and or a third party company to do a policy review. I always advise to meet with a third party company who doesn't have skin in the game so they can give you an unbiased opinion on the strengths of your policy or lack thereof. Brian and everyone on the call, you'd be shocked to find out the amount of stories we heard from Hurricane Ian from homeowners who incurred flood damage and assumed their hurricane coverage would cover it, not knowing they should have had flood coverage as well. Those people had to come out of pocket to fix their homes. I want to talk about a real disaster. Mm -hmm. And we had actually two clients recently that we're working with from the past hurricane, Hurricane Ian, two luxury uh, condominiums come up for their policy renewal. And they could have renewed with citizens for about, call it 500K, or go with a private market insurer for about a million dollars for the premium. And because they went through the hurricane and saw how important it was to have private insurance outside of citizens, and again, I'm sure Mary can speak to this, these people saw the value in having the better policy. Thus, they're willing to pay double the premium. I am sure there's a lot of you who run your agents absolutely ragged to get the best price premium. And I'm telling you right now, and I'm sure Mary will echo this, that the people that went through the hurricane are now taking the most expensive coverage for the most efficient claims recovery process, period. Now, another echoing Mary's point here. Secondly, you want to have documentation, cannot emphasize this enough, but you want to have documentation of your association at its pre-loss state. Have someone come out with the drone and capture the envelope of the building, or as my firm likes to call it, the big four, the roof, windows, rails, exterior coating. And having this done will help eliminate any disagreements you and the insurance company may have about your claim regarding pre-existing damage or wear and tear. You'll have clear and concise evidence to say, this is what it looked like before on said date, and this is how it currently looks after the event. There's, there's no way this is wear and tear, right? Right. And uh, right now, you know, given the landscape of the insurance market and the uptick in premium costs, it's more important than ever to make sure you have representation to assure that you're going to be able to recover every penny that you are owed in the event some type of property loss occurs. And I'll say this too, I want to leave on this point. One thing everyone doesn't consider while putting together their pre-storm plan is that the vendors that are going to be helping you also have, in most cases, have been affected in their own personal homes. They're mm -hmm. completely disrupted. Their supporting staff also doesn't have power, electricity, and their families are scattering. So it's important to have what I consider to be a lineup of vendors in your place. So that's what I call your A, B, and C teams. Not based on performance, but just you know backups. Just in the event that A's call it resources are strapped, you're able to reach out to your B team to then you know, get the work done. And just as uh, Mary had mentioned about the envelope with uh, some of the documents, keep digital copies of your building documents, policies, et cetera, you know, not just physical. Uh, there were multiple buildings in Sanibel and Captiva that had only hard copies of their documents in the management office at the bottom of the building. And those documents floated all the way out to the Gulf of Mexico. And without internet and power, they were unable to get their digital version set off, which delayed them significantly and the recovery efforts. So Brian, these are a few of the items that we want to have in place from a claims perspective before a storm hits. No, I think those, those are excellent points. And, and we say the same thing from the management side. It's, it's, it's important. It's imperative that you have the hard copy. And we actually say, you know, kind of keep it from a manager standpoint, keep it with them because you're right. They may not even be able to, if there is a storm that hits and uh, like Ian, they may not even be able to make it to the property to grab it from the manager's office um, you know, we do store everything in the cloud. So we're able to, you know, the moment you get access to the internet, you can, you can download some stuff or, you know, obviously the strength of a, of a management company is that you have your partners that can, that can help. So all great, great points. 
Uh, Michael, real quick from a, a roofing standpoint, we had one of the questions that came in. Um, and it's, is there any evidence that solar panels create a greater risk with the roof lift? Obviously with, uh, you know, heavy winds and things like that, you have a, a more of a sail type uh, layout. Is there more of a risk for having solar panels? We could have a whole hour on that conversation. Um, <laughs> where advanced roofing is also advanced green technology. So I, I've been in the solar business since 07. Um, if the solar, the answer question simply, if the solar is installed properly and to code, you're not going to have a problem. Um, we have all our solar systems that we install are hybrid systems with mechan mechanical attachment and um, ballast on the way the racking systems work. Now, the old, what I see even a lot of damage of, the answer of the question, the other side, of that, those are PV systems, is the solar hot water systems that they that put up on these roofs on the residential condos, they cause a lot of damage. Um, mm. They get through the code somehow with the wind ratings, and I'm not sure how they do the paperwork, but they get installed and they do let loose and they cause a significant amount of damage. Um, like I said earlier, my experience, and I've been through hurricanes since the early 2000s, is it's usually not the roof that fails, it's something else that fails that causes the roof to fail, um, i.e. an HVAC system coming off a curb or, you know, um, something hitting the roof. And then once the, the envelope of the roof has failed, it allows air in and it just peels it back, per se, like an orange or an apple. Um, so, Right. That's true. And that's uh, when when Brent's team would come in. Uh, and Brent, trust me, I'm going to get to you. Uh, this is all the, the planning, getting up to uh, uh, preparing for a storm. And, and you know, that your, 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 your company comes in when there is something and we need to go make that fix. So I trust me, I'm going to get to you in a second. Um, so one of the things we also like to do is obviously, uh, you know, all the preparation is good. We have all the documentation. And I say, you know, you have to practice a dry run late May, early June actually move the furniture, you know, and this goes back to communicating with uh, the residents saying, you know what, we're going to shut the pool down for the day. We're practicing moving the furniture. We're installing the shutters, whatever you need to do so that a, your team knows exactly how long is it going to take? Do we actually have the room? Did they buy new pool furniture that no longer stacks the way that the old furniture did? You know, all those little things we we've seen it. Uh, do you have all the nuts and bolts to install the shutters? Uh, you know, is there, have you greased, if you have accordion, have you greased all the, the the rails to make sure they actually close? The last thing you want to do is work on that when there is a storm bearing down uh, in your uh, in your area. And then, you know, from a communication standpoint, obviously you may have a lot of snowbirds, so they may be up north not hearing about all of the um, activity that could be happening in the Atlantic or, or the Gulf. So, you know, just let people know what you are doing. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, and then we we have we've said it many times, you know, take pictures, let them know that this is what we're doing. We are prepared. This is your chance as a manager to really shine in the preparation stage um, so that that you're ready and make sure that the board. Sorry for the pun is on board with what that plan is, because, you know, from we saw it during Ian where, you know, elevators, they didn't want to listen to the elevator contractor of where it should be locked down, when it should be locked down. And now they're going through a multi-million dollar renovation because the elevators were underwater. So, you know, there's all those different things. So that's why we say, you know, prepared now. Of course, if people aren't leaving during a storm uh, and they're gonna need the elevators, well, that's a board decision, yes. But we wanna make sure that, that you know, from a castle standpoint, from a management standpoint, we're covered and we have that, uh, that in writing of what those plans are. Mm -hmm. So again, this is what we we typically do. Uh, you know, four days out, we see the cone, we see what's happening, we start communicating, we start kind of activating what this looks like, and we have a complete plan: 96, 72, 36, and 24. A lot of it is, you know, David, I think you brought up the point. You know, you have your A, B, and C teams. You know, we make sure that our teams are ready and that they um, they know, you know, they're taking care of their homes, their families, they're ready because. There's going to be a lot of extra work and maybe some overtime happening as as things get ready, um, you know, as we work through these. And we talked about it before, that cone can change drastically in, in four days. And we all seem to be watching the news every two hours when a new alert comes out. It doesn't seem to change much. But if you look back over time, it absolutely does change. All right. And now, Brian, here's your, your section. So post-storm, you know, so in the unlikely event, 
um, you know, there is, uh, you know, a storm does come and it causes some damage. And we'll use Ian as a great example down on, in Southwest Florida. You know, it is, it's important. A, we want to make sure everybody's safe. Yes. And, you know, we require our managers to get back to property, uh, you know, four hours after the all clear is given, uh, which is, you know, making sure that they can A, get to the community and then it's starting to take pictures. And that's where, you know, you want to make sure that you can inspect the community, uh, look for damages and you can call a Brent. Hey, a lot of flooding. Here's what's happening because you want to solve these problems early. You want to take pictures. You want to get the restoration going, filing all the paperwork with uh, with insurance to make sure that we're covered. But the last thing you want is that water just be sitting there as well. So, Brent, kind of walk through uh, what and if you have some some additional items on the on the pre storm, you know, yeah. from your standpoint, how how should we treat? You know, when do we call you? What does what does that look like? Yeah, thanks, Brian, and good information from everybody. I've been taking notes as we're talking, so everybody has a lot of great things to share. Um, and I am going to step back because I love these types of uh, venues and lunch and learns that we do with you guys. And by the way, we're always available to do um, lunch and learns with your team, with your CAMs, your regional meetings, et cetera, because a lot of the problems solved now and being prepared. So that's my favorite. I'm a Boy Scout leader, and, uh, you know, it's be prepared. The more prepared you are, the better everything is going to go, the quicker you'll get back to your normalcy. And that's really our goal is to help, especially Castle. We have a great relationship with a lot of you, um, is to help you be look like a rock star to your boards and to your owners, that you have this thing ready to go, that you're in control, that you know what to do. And we're here to help you with that process. So um, I think Benjamin Franklin said, if you plan to fail or you fail to plan, you plan to fail right up front. So um, again, after the fact, it's too late. So yeah, we'll be happy to come in and, you know, do our job, but it's going to be a lot less expensive and a lot quicker if you, you know, upfront are ready and prepared with everything that everybody's talking about so far. Had a couple other items I wanted to share with you. Number one, develop a relationship with your restoration contractor before the storm. Everybody wants to be my best friend when the storm's hitting. <laughs> And guess what? I can't help everybody, but we do help the people I have a relationship with beforehand, which is what Castle is part of. Um, so it's very important that you know each other, not just have a contract signed, not just have an MSA in place. I'm talking about a true relationship where they know your business model. They know your community. They know your management team. They know your maintenance staff. They know where the water shutoffs are located. They know where the FRP is. You know, they know all of these things in advance. They know who your proper subs are. They know that you're, your roofing, your landscaper, your irrigation guy, your plumber, your electrician. I mean, we can help you be prepared for that. We have an ERP process that's free. We're happy to walk you through that and get you ready. But it's important you have all that contact information together before. Um Communicate with your suppliers and vendors before an event so they know what your plans are. You might be looking at being in a temporary office somewhere off-site. You might be shut down. You may not be able to access your property whatsoever. So let your suppliers, your subs, and your restoration guy know beforehand what your plans are, who's going to be the go-to person in case your phone doesn't work. Um if you will have a temporary work office, you know, where's that going to be? What's the phone number? What's the working hours? Um, provide an emergency access letter. This is huge. So you could be everything completely ready and prepared. You have the roofer, you have the landscaper, everybody's set up to go, but they will not be able to access your property because law enforcement, the National Guard, et cetera, could be holding everybody back because everybody says they're there to help, no mm -hmm. matter if they're actually your client or not. So if they have an official letterhead document saying, yes, please let URI and Brent's team in after the storm to help us out, they've been pre-authorized. That goes so fast to get us in there quicker and, and to take care of the damage and time is of the essence. Um, and obviously, the, you know, the other people on here, prepare your property, get your landscaper out there now, start trimming trees, make sure everything's pulled away from the buildings, clean out your gutters. Uh, your drainage, your culverts, your sewers, get all the debris out of there. If you have a, a you know remodeling contractor, a GC that does your repair work, get your leaky windows fixed, your doors, your roof leaks from your roofer. Do that now. Um, it's too late. And a lot of the things that happen from hurricanes are not really wind related. 
Um, and Michael um, alluded to that earlier. You know, it, construction is a lot better now. We're seeing a lot less issues with wind damage. We're seeing a ton more damage from water and especially the post-storm surge. So it's a very important thing to get your leaks wrapped up. Make sure your property is very well maintained beforehand. Um, and that's my main prep points. After the fact, you know, we'd be happy to come out and meet with you, do your assessments. My little QR code's on my screen. You can zap me. We're going to send out a, uh, a preparation manual that we provide all of our castle folks. I'll get the email list after we're done and send that out to you. It has a ton of great information. And of course, I'm here for any questions that you have. Thank you. Right, that that's great. And, you know, I, I see a couple of the questions in there, you know, about, um, you know, just, it is a lot about, you know, taking the photos and, and being prepared. And I think you know, if anybody can take, you know, one major um, thing from this presentation is start now and pull your team around the table. So your manager, you know, the, the restoration company, your, your uh, insurance broker, you know, any contractors that are there, you know, have that team meeting now so that everybody's on the same page, you know, uh, and most of your uh, vendors are, you know, Florida, you know, native, they've been around for 20 plus years as, as we've seen uh, today. So they've gone through the hurricane process before. So this is, they're not new to this rodeo, but your manager could be, your residents could be. So, you know, it's, it's important to start that conversation now and then make sure that you're communicating what you are doing out to the membership. Some that could be uh, snowbirds not living down here permanently, maybe not understanding the, the strength of what some of these hurricanes can do. Uh, so you want to start that process now um, because, you know, as, as Brent alluded to, you know, getting the storm drains cleaned up, you know, a lot of people don't even think about that. But if you don't properly uh, uh, even trim the trees so that all the leaves, uh, you know, it's not in Florida, it's not fall where all the leaves fall. It's kind of after January, February, where they start to defoliate and all those fill up your, your storm drains. So it's making sure that you, you cut back your trees, you get them hurricane cut, uh, and, and then you make sure those storm drains are clean. Cause that's where the water has to go. If you, if they are full of the leaves or covered up, then that's where your streets get flooded. The, and it, it's Florida, it's flat. All that water comes up your streets into your, uh, you know, front door and, or, you know, garages. So it's a uh, really important to kind of look at what your community does. And if you're in Miami, for example, and you have a high rise tower, do you have all your flood sacks? Do you have everything that's going to stop the water? We know Miami floods when it's just a, a normal afternoon rain, much less a, a, a hurricane that uh, would that typically coincides with the king tides and all these other things that, that happen. So it's really is just kind of preparing. And Brian, so, if I can, um, Brian, hey, Brian, I, I like, oh, sorry, guys, I'm real, real fast. Just because you guys, Brian and Brent both mentioned trees, I'll be super quick. Um, yes. Plan ahead, right? We're all saying it. That's certainly true. Most of your landscaping maintenance uh, proposals include pruning trees in there. But don't think that takes you off the hook. That's just kind of making the trees look pretty and nice around the holidays, right? Uh, that's not going to help you for a tree that might be structurally weak, that is in danger of falling on a building, on a car, on a bicycle, on a child, on whoever, right? So, you know, don't wait until... June 30th or there's a storm out in the Atlantic to say, oh, no, what about this tree? Do an inspection right now with your manager, your landscaper, your tree vendor, uh, whoever you have. If they're not going to do it, call me. We'll do it. But make sure you're proactive as much as possible to avoid any excess damage, injuries, problems, stress. That's great. And there's another question coming through as well. One other thing, Brian, on that, you, you're saying storm drains. I'd say make sure your, your maintenance personnel on flat roofs are checking the drainage on roofs. I've seen a plethora of failures, more than I've ever seen the last couple of years, where the roofs were fine, but the drains were backing up downstream, either through roots coming in the drains or whatever ancillary happened um, somewhere, not up on the roof, but then it was causing catastrophic failure at the roof level and then coming into the building. That's a yeah, that's a great point. When you have your uh, rainwater leaders coming off the side of your building and down, and they're not uh, they don't have free flow, that builds up a lot of head pressure that can cause a either a, a blowout on the side in the building or it fills up the roof, uh, which is supposed to be watertight anyway. So that's going to be kind of forming up a swimming pool, which which we don't want. Brent, uh, just tagging on to what he was just saying, and again, drainage is a big problem. So Hurricane Ian was our largest, you know, big loss um, in twenty two. 
And um, everybody thinks about Fort Myers. Yes, Fort Myers got, you know, they got kicked their butt pretty bad. But I'm in Orlando. We cover the entire state. We're, we're over the eastern seaboard and the Gulf Coast. But I'm in the Orlando office. We actually had our largest loss from Hurricane Ian in Kissimmee, which is in Orlando near Disney World. Um, and that was from rising waters um, from the drainage not being maintained by the city of Kissimmee. So even though the property had their act together, they were clean and ready and buttressed because the mm. city was not maintaining the culverts and the drainage of the canals. It backed up and they were in a low lying area. It affected 92 residents that were dislocated and it was a seven and a half million dollar uh, restoration project. So it's not just in Fort Myers, way, way away, you know, four hours away from Fort Myers was one of the biggest losses from rising water from all the water that came in and all the rain and the uh, the flood, you know, the flooding that happened. And flooding is the worst kind of water that can touch your property. Anything it touches is getting cut out and thrown in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. So be careful. All contaminated. That. Now, that's, yeah. a, that's a good point, actually. That's one of the questions that came in. You, you mentioned, you know, being far away from, uh, you know, a, a storm. Uh, these storms, if anybody's watched the news, and it looks like the question was, like, I live an hour away from the coast. Any uh, you know, issues. Uh, absolutely. You know, and, and these storms are massive. So Florida is only approximately an average of a hundred miles wide. So, and it's flat. So there's nowhere for the water to go other than try to get into the canals and then back out. And um, so as the storm works its way, if it's going, you know, from west to east or east to west, it will impact other areas. Now, your, your wind could diminish as you, as you come off, um, uh, off the water, but from, you know, flood surges, pushing in, pushing, uh, back up through the canal systems. Um, and a lot of the wind that could be there, you don't need a lot to pick up roof tiles, uh, anything that's uh, debris, uh, that can be tossed, uh, in through windows or, you know, and or through your car through damage, you know, things like that. So even though uh, Florida is just such a narrow state, that when a large storm comes through, uh, it impacts uh, so many different areas. I, I live about you know 20 miles from, or maybe 15 miles from the coast, but you still have to be uh, uber vigilant of how that storm surge looks. It can move uh, you know many miles inland um, as it, and then it works its way up through the canals, which back up into the drainage, which back up onto the streets. Um, and as you mentioned, up in, you know, the, the Kissimmee area, some low lying spots, even though they built the drainage systems around it, uh, if they're not properly maintained, they don't lower the canals enough to uh, absorb the surge. Uh, there's a number of uh, different things that could happen. But, you know, to, to the question that, that came through, even though you're an hour away from the coast, it's uh, that's driving time. So we know that could be, you know, 20 miles in Florida. So, um, you know, you still have some could have some major impacts from a storm. I would say as long as you're in the path of a hurricane, coast or not coast, again, I'm Orlando, so we're about an hour from any coast, um, that damage can be just as severe. We saw it with Hurricane Charlie, all that kind of stuff. I would prepare as if I were on the coast. If it, I mean, there are going to be checklists that things don't apply to where you live. Just keep moving on, but prepare as if you are in the direct path. Right. Agreed. One of the other questions that came in is, you know, the the generators and installing a generator uh you know and the, actually the specific question was how reliable is you know the supplied gas for that generator you know that i i wish i had an easy answer um obviously you want to have that contract with your gas supplier but we've all seen the lines at gas stations and trying to get it all depends on how uh the the um uh, the, on where the distribution centers are they shut down can we i mean we we were impacted uh, a couple of years back and you couldn't get gas lines out uh so everybody was kind of operating so it really all depends most of the time though they're pretty good if the roads are open the gas stations are open things like that yes we may not have power for another another reason uh lines went down things like that but um you know getting gas is is, is fairly um reliable um, let's see, what other questions did we have coming through? I want to toss out to you guys. Um, so from, you know, a few of you actually mentioned drones. Uh, you know, how should they go about 
hiring a drone company? Is it through engineers? I know a lot of the engineers are doing them now for the milestone inspections and, and SERS reports for the towers. Uh, what other companies can do a, a, a reliable drone survey? Well, I'd say, you know, it's something we offer in our pre-loss programming here. And then I like to believe, Michael, forgive me for speaking out of term here, but I imagine Michael and his company have a service just based on what they do for roofing, where probably even have a, in their master service agreement in some type of fashion, where every year they're droning the roof for insurance purposes and for their own purposes. So I would say my company, our company, and then uh, and mine, uh, Michael's as well. Excellent. Yeah, we, we are... Uh... We're implementing the drones this year. We do a lot of pre-inspections in our maintenance and our master service agreements, maintaining the roofs, maintaining the drains. And then we are we have eight drones that are flying currently uh, with still pictures, video. And then uh, we also can do infrared um, in the evenings to see if there's any moisture and do an investigative work from a, a roofing and waterproofing standpoint as well. That is uh, that's great. Um, you know, actually, uh, a few comments have have sparked uh, a bunch more questions on the city drainage and ponds that fill up. And I think probably are a few are maybe some some new Florida residents uh, that see all the canals and the ponds that have to be um, that are all part of the overarching drainage. Uh, and just as a, I was an engineer prior to coming to Castle and actually designed a lot of the uh, drainage systems here in South Florida, um, and they all tie together. Uh, and there's certain rules about how uh, you know as the streets. The, the, the rainwater flows into the um, the pipes, which flow out into either a drainage pond, which allows the water to kind of percolate down. So do they flood? It all depends on the volume of water that comes in. They're designed to hold a certain amount of water before they breach in and go into uh, neighboring areas or, you know, percolate down or, you know, they have to go into another drainage structure, that, which goes out into a canal. So there's a number of different rules around it, but a lot of them are actually designed to flood, if you will. Now, what, what happens, what the cities do in the county, and it's all part of uh, either, whatever part of the, the state you're in. So down here in Southwest Florida uh, or Southeast Florida, South Florida Water Management District, they're at, they have all their various water districts. In If they believe that they're in the path of a hurricane or a major storm event, They'll actually lower the canals significantly. You'll see the, the green grass and you'll see the dead grass and the dead plant material. They'll lower those significantly knowing that there's going to be a um, an influx of water coming. Um, and so you'll definitely see those. Uh, but that's, and that's why. And some associations actually, uh, they're responsible. They'll, they'll have access to the weir itself, which is a basically a movable dam, which opens and closes. And so if they're in the path of the storm, they have agreements with the various counties to raise or lower that weir so that the water cresting over uh, can happen at an earlier rate, they lower the canals down. So that's that was a couple questions that came through. Um, oh, so here's here's one, and maybe from an insurance standpoint, Mary, you can chime in. You know, when a property is in the evacuation zone, and so an evacuation order has been given, you know, a lot of owners decide to stay. Um, yeah. Are there any, and, and listen, I, I, I get it, either there they could be mm -hmm. elderly, so they don't want to leave. They don't have anywhere else to go. Uh, so there's a number of reasons. Any insurance ramifications, pros, cons about them staying? Um, no, um, you follow what the state is, is mandating. They will have mandatory evacuations. They'll have voluntary. We can encourage, we can never force unless it is mandatory by the county, by the state. Um, there's pros and cons to evacuating and not evacuating. That's a, that's another hour worth of conversation too. <laughs> um, you know, the quick answer is you're there to assess and address any damage that happens as it happens, but you're also putting yourself in a great deal of danger to do so. Um, so it, I think I saw it to the shutters question. If you put shutters up, do you have to leave? No, you don't. You can stay in your house shuttered. Um, I actually have personally done that. I hated it. And I told my husband, I will never do that again. Um, because when you're shuttered, you can't see what's going on on the outside. Oh, you form so a cave. I'm hearing all the, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you're in a dark cave hearing all of the effects of a hurricane happen to your house and you can't see out or go out to see what's happening. So um, I don't recommend it, but I but you are not mandated to leave at that point. 
Um, if you do leave, you are, you know, of course, giving you that level of safety um, that you, your person and your, you know, special belongings are going to remain intact. Um, power, water, electricity, uh, cell phone service, all going to remain intact, assuming you're, you know, far enough out of the zone, for sure. Um, but you may not be able to get home right away. So again, there's there's pros and cons to uh, evacuating, and but unless it's mandatory by the state or county, you, you can't force anybody to go. Yeah, and we actually talk a lot, and I know we're down to our last kind of nine, ten minutes left. So um, you know, thank you, Brian, for, for for bringing that up. I was actually coming on just to uh, make sure you were aware of the time, and I do want to say that. We are going to have this recording on castlegroup.com. So if you've missed, you know, or you want to go back and listen to it over again, please go onto our website and it'll be uploaded onto our website. Also, mm -hmm. I do want to share the information for all of our panel experts. Uh, David Akers, who is with Strong Claims, you can reach him at david at strongclaims.com. Jerry Esposito with Extreme Landscaping. Jay Esposito extremelandscaping.com, Eric Woods from Advanced Roofing, Eric W at advancedroofing.com, Brent Dixon from URI at B Dixon, Urinow, spelled U-R-I-N-O-W.com, and Mary Swanson from IOA, Mary.Swanson at IOAUSA.com. And I see you putting up your hand, Brent. Is there a question? His QR code. He's got his QR code ah. right there. You can take pictures. <laughs> Thank so, you, Brian. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, listen, I want to, you know, one of the final comments on the evacuation zones, um, you know, when we we manage a number of communities that, um, you know, have been in those random evacuation zones. And, you know, what we do is we alert the residents. The majority of them do leave and do evacuate. There are the few that stay. We take note of who is staying because our team is leaving and they're going to take care of their families. Um, and a lot of times the, the police, the fire rescue will come in and say, you know, we will not be here. If there is a fire, flood, anything like that, we can't, it's an evacuation zone. We can't, we're not going to put our team in jeopardy because you've decided to ignore the evacuation. So there's a lot of, the, they'll try to put the fear uh, a, a little bit more into them than than maybe we do from the management side. But, you know, that is, you know, it, it's important to understand that the police, the fire rescue aren't going to put themselves in a harm way when you've, uh, you know, blatantly ignored those evacuation orders. Uh, so we try to stress that to the best of our ability with our residents. And, you know, a, a large majority, they do heed those warnings and they move to uh, the various zones. If it, if people are evacuating for a reason. It's not because they're just thinking something's going to happen. They're evacuating for a reason. Brian, um, I, yes. on that. I can tell Please. you from experience, especially from Hurricane Ian, there was not one person that we had met in Bonita Beach, Fort Myers, Sanibel, Captiva that said, man, I'm really happy I stayed behind. <laughs> right. <laughs> Talk about exactly. the left. Never, Never happens. So right. heed all these warnings. Absolutely. Right. I think um, too, it, just to add a real quick, um, there's no protection. It's the Wild West. If you decide to stay, you are on your own. And there's no, you know, coming back to sue the city if somebody robs you or, you know, steals your stuff and, you know, murders somebody or whatever. You're, it's the Wild West. So you're taking that risk on yourself. Yeah. You know, a couple of questions have come in as well. Like if we do leave, now we do evacuate, when can we come back? Well, those, uh, they'll, they'll, you know, turn off the evacuation orders, you know, once the all clear is given. Um, and that means the storm has passed, all those outer bands have passed. Typically, you know, um, we actually require our managers to get back on property about four hours after the all clear, make sure their home is safe. They, they, they could live, you know, maybe a half hour away um, and they have to make their way back onto, um, it could be a barrier island. They need to have the certain passes to get on. We discussed that a little bit as well, um, but to make sure that they get back and examine the property. Uh, same for the, the residents. Once the all clear is given, you, you're able to, to return home. So, um, and again, it is uh, talking about the damage. The challenge that some people have is our snowbirds don't know when that all clear is given. They're making phone calls. We have our, our resident services team that fields a bunch of phone calls, literally asking, how was my unit? Um, you know, and, and we don't know 100% until we're able to get back on, on property. 
So I just want to kind of with five minutes left, uh, maybe do some closing remarks. I know this is fast and furious, but I, I think the most important part is that we uh, we get you start the preparations now. It's you know, it's mid-April, you know, we're going to be June 1st very, very quickly. So it's it's all about starting the uh, preparations now. So I'll kind of start since I ended with Jerry, I'm going to start with Jerry uh, on the way out uh, and I'll let everybody have some some closing remarks. Thanks, Brian and everyone. Uh, great information today. Um, yeah, so feel free to reach out to us over at Extreme. Uh, you can reach out to me, uh, Millie, provided my email. Um, you know, we'll do a free site assessment for you. Even if it's just your monthly maintenance, we're happy to do that. Anything storm-related, prep, trees, irrigation. Um, it's good to have that data and knowledge when you get asked a question by your colleagues or your residents to, to say, hey, we've thought about this and we've prepared and, and we're ready to roll. So please reach out to me. We're happy to come out for free and take a look. Thank you. Great. David? Yeah, thank you, Brian. As Brian had mentioned, this has been more of a rapid fire session. I think every vendor on today's call could probably spend the next 24 hours talking about hurricane, hurricane prep, certain, you know, getting into the weeds about certain things. And, you know, my takeaway here for everyone on the call is would love to have the opportunity to speak with each and every one of you individually about our pre loss planning program and how we can make sure your association is in the best case scenario possible in the event if something happens this year in the state of Florida. So we really appreciate everyone's time, really appreciate the opportunity to be alongside here with the Castle Group, and I look forward to continue to build this business partnership with one another. Perfect. Thank you, David. Michael. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And my closing remarks is make sure you're getting your preventative maintenance done on the roof, like I said, changing the oil and checking your tires on your roof um, before the storm the storms come. And then if you do have damage after the storm, make sure you're choosing a, a local reputable contractor. I can't, I'm cleaning up uh, more stories than I can tell you right now on the West Coast of uh, contractors from out of state because uh, they're cheap or somebody brought them in and they're just, they didn't put down the right roof. Now these people paid their insurance money out to a contractor. Now they're coming out and have to spend out of pocket to uh, fix the roof again. So that's uh, my word of advice for the day. That's, that is a, a very good point. I see Brent shaking his head too. It is, we talk about that with our managers all the time. It's, you know, penny wise, pound foolish philosophy gets everybody in trouble. And uh, so go get the reputable vendor. And yes, it may cost just a little bit more, but the headaches and the nightmare scenarios uh, will cost far exceed anything, any difference in prices. Brent? Yeah, thanks again. Uh, great tips and information from everybody. Again, uh, number one, build a relationship with your restoration contractor. We're here. I'm going to send out our information and our prep packet. Uh, feel free to call me and uh, schedule appointments for any kind of training, lunch and learns, et cetera. I uh, wanted to leave you with a good tip. Make sure you load yourself with good weather pages, uh, one of which is Mike's weather page. We follow that religiously. He is uh, mm -hmm. awesome, and his website is called SpaghettiModels.com. Um, he's a storm chaser. He's really funny, a good old boy redneck from Tampa, and he's probably <laughs> the best weather guy I've ever seen. He's very, uh, very thorough. So yes. keep that in mind, and also go buy accurate. your get your staff some uh, walkie-talkies, as we call them, um yep. after the storm it's great to have those your phones may not work but it's great to be in contact and that way you can have somebody out in the field with the walkie-talkie reporting damage while somebody's in the office typing or taking notes it's a little uh, time saver and good way to stay in touch with each other uh great building relationships with you we look forward to working with you i know you don't want to call us but we're here for you if you need us thank you great thanks brent and last but not least mary um yeah i'm gonna tag on to brent's statement about Mike's weather page. We actually follow that more than any of them. Um, and I'm on the emergency response committee with IOA. So that should tell you where we get our information and the accuracy is definitely there. Um, again, that emergency folder, build it now. Um, it probably won't happen on June, June 1st when we start off hurricane season that you need it. But when you need it, you don't want to be scrambling for it. Carry it on a person. Don't leave it in the office and documentation. If there's anything I can tell any insured about any claim that it is any time is documentation, photos, receipts, anything like that, that you can show what the value of something was, what the condition of something was, um, how it looked, how you want it restored. That's the important part, keeping things easier for the adjuster to restore your normal. Um, again, 
if you don't have checklists and you need those resources, Insurance Office of America has them, you are more than welcome to reach out to me or your agent. Uh, we are happy to supply those to you now. Um, again, mary.swanson at ioausa.com. Um, again, document and prepare. It's Hurricanes are going to happen. There's no way around that. Oh, definitely. Well, thank you to our panel of experts and to Brian Street for moderating and to everyone who joined us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you. Be safe.